please. Acts chapter 25 and beginning in verse 13. We're going to consider Acts 25 verse 13 through chapter 26 and verse 32 in class today. Reason being is it's really all one event. It's all one discussion. And before we dig in, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for our time of study this morning. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for worship, which we're about to engage in in just a moment. We pray that it will honor you as you are the true and living God. We pray that you'd be with our shepherds as they watch over us. Be with us in our evangelistic efforts and opportunities. Be with those who are sick, hurting, and afflicted. Pray that you'd be with all of, our, all of the students this morning and all of us included in that. May we all make right application to be better servants of yours in this dark world of sin. We love you, Lord. Pray you'll be exalted. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 25, beginning in verse 13. Let's kind of, let's kind of go back in our minds and, and remember what's going on. Seems like we've slept since the last class. So it would probably be good to do this. At this point, Paul is still in Caesarea. He is under Roman guard, and he is under the jurisdiction of a man named Festus. Festus was the man who came after Felix. And so Festus, history would tell us, was a little bit better, a little bit nicer, a little bit more cordial, and Felix was absolutely hated. Now, as this, these discussions take place early in chapter 25, Paul appeals to Caesar. He recognizes that Festus will not give him a fair shake. He's not going to get justice, and so the option was appeal to go and see Caesar, which every Roman citizen had the right to do, especially in a, a case where it was maybe out of the typical, out of the norm. So, you know, if this was a, a pretty cut-and-dry situation, citizen couldn't appeal to Caesar. The Roman governor had the right to execute whatever, even execute him, literally kill him, uh, and he had no right to appeal to Caesar. But if it was an abnormal element of some kind, like Paul's case, then the citizen could appeal to Caesar and thus go to Caesar. Now, as some of that's happening, we're not really told why there seems to be a delay. It may just be trying to catch particular vessels, Roman official vessels, to take him. It's not really clear, but whatever happens, he's not immediately sent. And so at the end of verse 12, Festus is very clear, you're going to Caesar. That's what you wanted, that's what you're going to get, Paul. And then that doesn't actually happen immediately. Now keep in mind, and this may be kind of why some of this doesn't happen so quickly, Festus, has, it appears, has just taken the governorship. Because in verse 1, he comes to the province three days. That tells us this is a very quick line of events. Three days, he goes up to Caesarea, he stays there for a few days, and then he comes back, and the next day he shows up on his judgment seat in the tribunal. And so, man, this, this really may be the first week or two of Festus' governorship. That may be why Paul is not just immediately sent, but again, that's not clear, not told. Okay? I hope you have your questions done. Trying to cover this big of a section, that's what we're going to work through, is the questions. So question number one. Question number one, this is a big section, verses 13 through 21. Why does Festus consult Agrippa? Exactly, exactly. He is an expert in the laws and customs of the Jews. A uh, couple of things about that. The, the Agrippas, the Herods, were descendants of the Edomites. And so they, they even had a little bit of Jewish in their lineage. And, and then, you know, going beyond the blood, they even were very, very akin to the Jewish customs. We noticed that a little bit with several of the Agrippas we've read about, the Herods we've read about in Acts. Uh, Agrippa I in Acts chapter 12, I, I went through a long discourse about history and how he was a very Jewish, respectful man. The Jews loved Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa II wasn't much different. Now, a couple of connections you need to see here. Verse 13, King Agrippa and Bernice came to greet Festus. It's as if they're paying tribute or honor to Festus who now has the governorship. Agrippa II, Bernice is his sister. 
Now, the, the fascinating connection here, do you remember Drusilla, the wife of Felix in the last chapter? That is also Agrippa II's sister. So Bernice and Agrippa in verse 13, their sister is Drusilla in the previous chapter. Now Luke doesn't tell us all of that, secular history would, Josephus primarily would. And so there's a lot of familial connections to this governorship, okay, vested interest in what goes on here. And beyond that, the Herods had the right to oversee Jerusalem practices. Now they didn't actually have jurisdiction in Jerusalem necessarily, but they did have the right to control some of the Jewish practices in Jerusalem. They were the ones who appointed the high priests, which was not biblical. Remember that. Old Testament law, that was not the way it was supposed to be. But Agrippa appointed the high priest. The, the Herods would show up for the festivals, the three big festivals a year. Herod was going to be there, whichever Herod was in charge. They also, because they appointed the high priest, they kept, they kept the priestly garments and would give them to the high priest for their day of atonement. So lots of influence, lots of control, and a whole lot of tension. But this is exactly why Luke tells us through the words of Festus that this man is a practitioner. He is an expert of Jewish things. Why? Because he has dealt with Jews all of his life, even having a little bit of Jewishness in his background. Okay? Everybody got that? All right. Now, you're going to see some of this stuff pop up through all of this stuff. Even Paul acknowledges some of these concepts in verse 3 of chapter 26. He says, you're an expert in all customs and all questions having to do with Jews. I don't, think that was, I don't think that was Paul twisting the facts. I think that was a fair observation. The man knew the Jewish practices, okay? And I'm going to tell you, I, I, when, I re, when you read through this section and you recognize that subtle fact, it makes the preaching of Paul here that much more powerful. He's not just defending Christianity, folks. And this is exactly why Agrippa says, you're going to make me a Christian? That's because Paul was trying to make him a Christian. Paul was preaching to a man who knew the Jewish customs. And so he is just, poof, you know the Jewish customs? That gets you to Jesus. Come on, Agrippa, obey the gospel. Okay? So see some of those nuances in the text. Question number two. What seems to be prompting this informal interrogation on Festus's part? Verse 24 through verse 27. What seems to be prodding this, prompting this? Well, and I think that gets at some of it. Here's what I want you to notice. All right, verse 24. Let's go ahead and just read this. I think this is kind of subtle but important. Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain. Here it is. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me reason, unreasonable excuse me, to send a prisoner and not to signify the charges against him. Now, think about this. His predecessor was almost killed for misappropriation of authority in this position. He wants to be abundantly cautious here. If he was going to send a prisoner to Caesar who had appealed to Caesar, he better have it in clear, detailed, and concise writing what the charges were. I made the point a moment ago. A citizen could appeal to Caesar, but only in abnormal cases. If this was a normal case, how do you think Caesar's going to handle that? Caesar's a pretty busy guy. Okay? He's got a whole world to rule, people to oppress, people to misuse, people to abuse. He's very, very busy. Okay? He doesn't want to be messing around with his nonsense. If his newly appointed governor can't handle this, mm, the boss is like that. That's something I gave you the job so you would do. I wouldn't have to do it. You recognize my point? So part of the, what undergirds this is, I need to know what to write. Hey, Agrippa's in town. He knows this stuff. I'll get his help. Now, I worded the question a particular way for a particular reason. This is an informal questioning. Once the citizen has appealed to Caesar, he does not stand for trial anymore. No governor under Roman oversight had the right or authority to actually formally try this person anymore. He's already appealed to Caesar. You get what I'm saying? So this is not a formal case. 
And you're going to notice some of those nuances. If you read through some of this, you, you'll almost notice chapter 26, verse 1, Agrippa kind of takes over things. Then Agrippa said to Paul. Now, again, that's, that's Festus saying, Agrippa, you kind of talk to him. So this is not a formal thing. This is a very, very informal thing. Now, I want you to see, as this festivities take place, Paul is brought in before them. You're going to notice that there are the movers and shakers of society here. So it's Agrippa, it's Bernice, it's Festus, it, it, it's going to be the, the military officials who, who were stationed at Caesarea. It's a pretty big audience, big people, big time, high social status. Okay, That's who Paul is standing before in this tribunal, informal tribunal. Okay, Now, verse 20. Uh, four, a couple of things I want you to notice. Or excuse me, verse 25. Verse 25, Festus declares Paul's innocence. Did you catch that? He has done nothing worthy of death. Man, don't you love that? Remember, he's writing to Theophilus. Luke is writing the historical account to Theophilus, who is, by all accounts, a Roman high official in some way. We recognize that. Remember Luke chapter 1, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He says, O Theophilus, O most excellent Theophilus, that is a high official in Roman courts. Okay? So that's part of what's, under, what, what's going on here. Very subtle, but he declares Paul's innocence. Now, when he mentions uh, Augustus, that's Augustus Caesar, but I want you to notice verse 26. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord, my Lord. Now, we're pretty familiar with this. Some of the tension between Christianity and the Roman world in the first century was who's really the Lord. Remember, uh, some of you may remember Revelation class. That's Man, that's just a huge concept in Revelation. Who's really the Lord? Because Nero, who is the Caesar at this time, he liked to be called Lord. It was Lord Nero, Lord Caesar. Now, Domitian, towards the end of the first century, makes it ten times worse. You call you called you know, Domitian, you call me my Lord and my God. Now, all of that is significant with biblical language. That's the declaration Thomas makes of Jesus, my Lord and my God. Folks, that's, that's essentially saying this is the true and living God, not any Roman Caesar. That's part of what, Revelation. That's part of, that's part of the, the subtle thing here. That's my Lord. Caesar is my Lord. Whereas Paul is saying Jesus is the Lord. Okay? Everybody with me on that? All right, just a subtle thing, but I wanted you to notice it. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, so that's part of what's undergirding these discussions here and fueling some of this fire. Now, you get into chapter 26 and some of these interactions between Agrippa and Paul. Now, the next question, question number three, gets into verses four and five. But I want us to read verse two and three. Paul says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. I love the gusto of Paul in verse 2. Now, again, again, recognize they have no right to execute him at this point anymore, okay? They don't have the right to do that anymore because since he has appealed to Caesar, nobody can do that but Caesar at this point. But still, to be standing before the highest officials in the land and just saying, I am so thrilled to get to speak to you today. Wow. I don't know if I'd be that thrilled, okay? I'll just be honest. I don't know if I'd be that thrilled. Paul was. Man, this is the exact platform I wanted. Why? Because he's got at least one man in his audience, maybe two with uh, Bernice, because she had a Jewish background too. Maybe two people in his audience who are receptive to the gospel. It's the whole point. You're the people who are experts in the customs and the practices of the Jews. I have an audience member who might be hook, line, and sinker by the time I'm done preaching. Man, I love that enthusiasm. I love that optimism. And I think we need a little bit of that when it comes to sharing the gospel. Not everybody's going to say, no, you're a moron, okay? Most people, sure, might not have anything to do with your faith. Let's just be clear, 
might not have anything to do with your faith. I get that comment sometimes, and it's nothing to do with my faith. You, sir, are a moron. Thank you. So, you know, you got to have some kind of energy, some kind of passion for what you're doing, and Paul very clearly has that here. Man, I am so thrilled to get to preach to this audience this day because I have people who might listen to the gospel. All right, question Question three, how would all the Jews know about Paul's upbringing? Verses four and five. Say again. Because he grew up around there. Now, remember, he was raised in Cilicia, raised in the city of Tarsus, but, but the typical practice would have been childhood was spent there, but keep in mind, he would have traveled to Jerusalem for the feasts. So he grew up going to Jerusalem. And then when he got to be an older man, or became a man, I should say, like formal education came along, 15 to 18, he was relocated to Jerusalem and raised at the seat of Gamaliel. Okay? When he obeys the gospel, he's probably somewhere in his late 20s because that, that would have been about the right time, that would have been about the right cultural practice. Is everybody following that? Everybody that's a Jew and older would have known Paul or known about him, you don't rise through the ranks of Judaism like he does in Galatians 1.14 without some of the older folks still knowing you. We recognize that in chapter 22, 23, and 24, if you'll remember. Okay, These folks, they could testify to this. He was a Jew. They all knew him. Uh, Dennis? Yeah. 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 Sure. You know, you you have to you have to love. Paul has plenty of opportunities to defend his innocence, and yet what he does more often than not, he'll make a statement about him being innocent. Okay, it's not that he never defends himself. But boy, every time he turns around in chapter 21 through chapter 26, what he does is he ties it in somewhere to the gospel. you got to see that, folks. Because it's like, folks, I'm a good Jew. I'm a good Jew because I believe Jesus. You know, that's how, So he's defending himself, and then he ties it in with Jesus somewhere. I'm a good Jew just because I believe in the resurrection. Of who? Of Jesus. Even when he's not saying Jesus, he's still saying Jesus. Okay, So, so see that point. I think it's a great observation. Jesus is just at the forefront of his defense. He's innocent, and uh, yeah, Jesus. So we need to see that. All right, question number four, and this kind of ties into that point. Why was Paul being accused? Let's read this, verses 6 and 7. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. <coughs> Why was he accused? Oh, go ahead, Curtis. Absolutely. 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 He simply believed what the promises brought. This is actually one of those little statements, folks, that, that is so packed with significance. It's not even funny. It's one of those little statements where, again, Jesus is not explicitly named, but Jesus is the subject of the Old Testament, folks. We've made this point several times in several of these defense uh, speeches of Paul. We've got to see that point. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's his point here. You think about this. He says, I'm standing here and I'm being judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promises of God, the covenantal promises of God were about Jesus. You, you go back into Genesis 3 and the serpent's head being crushed, that's a Jesus prophecy. You, you go to Genesis 12 and all the nations being blessed by the blood of Abraham, that's a Jesus prophecy. 
You, you think about the promises through the Mosaic period. It's always, always, always pointing us to Jesus. Paul got that point. You can't go back and read the Old Testament and ignore the reality of Jesus of Nazareth, folks. The most appropriate way to read the Old Testament now on this side of the cross is to read it through the lens of the cross. And it always takes you back to the hill of Golgotha. Okay? Paul gets that. Now he says in verse 7, he says this is the promise, our 12 tribes. That's a very Jewish concept, right? The 12 tribes of Israel. He says this is the thing, they earnestly serve God night and day. They hope to attain. The problem was they were so blind to the reality of Jesus being the fulfillment of these things, they would not attain it. They were hoping for it, but they wouldn't accept it when it got here. We saw that all through the Gospels, didn't we? Jesus is the fulfillment of these things, but they're too blind to that truth. They will not accept it. Now, I want you to see verse 8. I don't have a question on verse 8 in this text, but I want you to see verse 8. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God should raise the dead? That seems so out of context, doesn't it? All right. Who's he talking about? Oh, come on. It's the Bible class answer. It's Jesus. Come on. Always Jesus. If it's not Jesus, it's baptism. We know these answers, guys. Come on. It's Jesus. Okay. I want you to see what he's doing here. He's essentially making the argument that the promises of God being fulfilled were not beyond his ability to do. Why? Why is it beyond his ability to raise a man from the dead? That's nothing. That's nothing when he works through history for thousands of years, saving a rebellious people, keeping back a remnant for himself, saving them from the Exodus and say, from, from Egypt in the Exodus, saving them from Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, saving them from oppression and persecution, and saving them from being utterly destroyed to make Jesus happen. Galatians 4, Paul says, when the fullness of time had come, he brought forth his son through the woman. Folks, all of the things God did is raising someone from the dead beyond him? No, <laughs> no, it's nothing. You see the logic of Paul's argument? Agrippa, who, who, who had some inkling to these things, should have seen this. The Jews should have seen this. They believed authentically what God had done in the Old Testament. God literally, this is not a fairy tale story, it's not a bedtime story. God literally, took a sea monster and swallowed a man in the depths of the ocean with it, preserved his life and made the monster vomit him up on dry land and still made him go preach the gospel of that time to a people who, who refused to believe in God. Is raising one man from the dead beyond him? Man, that is so rational, so logical in Paul's argumentation here. And that's his exact point. You think this is beyond, uh, beyond God? Mm -mm. You believe in the promises? You should believe in Jesus. You should believe in the resurrection. Now, this ties in with the next question, but well, let's go ahead and read this, tie it with it here. He says, verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You know what he's arguing right here? He's arguing that he too once thought it was too remarkable for God to raise a man from the dead. You recognize that's his point. Now, he's saying, yeah, the way I went about it was, was persecuting the name of Jesus. Why? Because he, at one time, thought it was too incredible to believe someone came back from the dead. Now, several months ago, I preached on the resurrection and made the point, Paul never doubted the tomb was empty. That was never up for debate. The, the, the issue was, why was the tomb empty? Okay? Saul of Tarsus had grown up around the hierarchy of the Jewish people. They had a reason the tomb was empty. The disciples stole the body. Paul never doubted the body was gone. He doubted what happened to the body. Okay? That is why when he is confronted with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he flips a switch and changes. Because he was confronted with the truth. Okay? But at this point, he's describing what he was doing before. So, 
Let's ask the question that I just answered. Question number five. In what ways had Paul worked contrary to the name of Jesus? That was a softball. By persecution, by imprisoning the saints, absolutely. Now, remember uh, uh, something that's happened several times in Acts at this point. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. We noticed that a little bit in the previous chapter. That, that's a little thread that goes through the book of Acts. Remember Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Quotation from Joel. You, you also go to the end of Acts chapter 2 to verse 38. Repent and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Arise now, why are you waiting? Uh, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul's talking about a time when he didn't believe in the power of Jesus' name. See that? Yeah, he changed. That's part of his point. He changed. But this point in his history, he did everything he could to cut the name down. When the name of Jesus was spoken on the lips of his disciples, Paul saw it as blasphemy. Paul saw it as apostasy. R remember something, folks. To the Jew, somebody claiming to be God, oof. I mean, there, there were some circles of Judaism where you didn't even, you didn't even say, the name of, uh, say the name of God. Yahweh. This is the reason that your Bible translates that in lots of places, in every place, as L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D. Because in Hebrew Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish thinking, you didn't say the name Yahweh. They were so cautious of blaspheming that name. That's part of the issue in John 8. Jesus said, before, I, or before uh, Abraham was, I am. That's a statement of deity. So when Paul comes on the scene, still as Saul of Tarsus, a very faithful Jew, and these people are coming along and saying, Jesus is Lord, that's blasphemy. If it's not true, it's blasphemy. That's the reason he tries to persecute these people to such a hateful degree. That's the reason... He goes and gets permission from the chief priest to put them in prison. That's the reason he cast his vote against them. That's the idea of they're up for trial. Is death on the table? Yes, I vote yes. They get killed. That's what Paul was doing. In verse 11, he was so passionate, so exceedingly enraged against them that he even went way beyond the city of Jerusalem, persecuting them to the foreign cities. Damascus was a long ways away, but he was following these people because he wanted them gone just like his audience wants him gone now. See how the roles have reversed? The tables have turned. The turns, the turns have tabled. All right. Let's just check and see if y'all's awake still. All right, question number six. What does he mean when he says, while thus occupied, verse 12, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest? What's he talking about? Yeah, persecuting Christians. Persecuting Christians. So the, the attitude in verse 11, he was compelling them to blaspheme, that is, renounce the name of Jesus. He is exceedingly enraged against them. He's traveling all over the cities, all over the Judean world, trying to get them, in verse 12, while thus occupied. That is, while he was busy doing those things, while he was actively engaged in those things, journeying to Damascus, verse 13 now, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and with those who journeyed with me. That's when he was confronted. At his most zealous moments, when he was so vehemently passionate against these people, that's when God confronted him and turned him around. Now, at this point, there's not a lot of differences. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at this comparative account here. Verse 14, when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. <coughs> he said, excuse me, and I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have prepared, or I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
really, verses 16 through 18 is a further explanation of the things that Paul was told earlier. We don't get all of those details in the previous accounts. And notice, that's Jesus speaking in this account. But the words, some of the words quoted here were attributed to Ananias in the previous accounts. Okay, that's not a contradiction. Remember, Ananias speaks to Paul in Acts 9. Paul recounts some of it in Acts 22. The words of Ananias were Jesus' words, right? You get that? So on one occasion, it's attributed to Ananias. The other occasion, it's attributed to Jesus because that's the real source anyways, all right? Now, notice, uh, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It's agricultural terminology. Essentially, it's, it's like kicking the guy who's prodding you, okay? I have been kicked many times, actually. I've still got a broken kneecap from being kicked by prodding things that didn't want to be prodded, okay? You get kicked by animals that, that you're prodding. That's just the way that works. Well, that's what happened to Paul. Paul was working against God. And essentially, God's saying, Paul, when are you going to stop it and get in line? That's the point. Now, notice verse 16. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you've seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. There is a path, a path, a past, a past. There's a past and a future concept here, okay? So he, he says, Paul, I've done this so that you can testify, you can minister, you can witness of the things which you have seen, things that have already happened, and of the things which will happen, okay? Now, all of this we observed in chapter 22 when Paul's retelling some of these things. All of this establishes his authentic apostle witness, okay? He is a full apostle, He makes that same argument in Galatians chapter 1, by the way. Galatians chapter 1, the whole chapter basically, is defending his apostolic authority. This is why he was an apostle, because Jesus appeared to him, making him an apostle so that he could go do these things. Now, verse 17, I'm going to deliver you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles. So verse 18, so that he could do this. Now, every one of these are synonymous with each other. Different nuances with each phrase, but they're still making the same point, okay? So open their eyes from darkness to light, from power of Satan to God, for the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance for those who are sanctified. It's making the same point. Now, appreciate one element of this, though. Those are all things that happened to Paul. Paul had his eyes opened, literally and figuratively. Paul went from darkness to light, literally and figuratively. He was removed from sin, taken from the clutches of Satan, given over to the purposes of God for which he would serve and for which he would minister. All of the same things that Paul went through, God is telling him, you're going to go and do it for other people now. You get that? Now, part of that brings those forgiveness of sins. It brings about this sanctification. Makes you sanctified, sets you apart, makes you holy. I think we need to appreciate something here, folks. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a sanctified person who's out trying to help other people be sanctified. You get that. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be gospel sharers. We we are gospel livers, but we're also gospel sharers. That's who we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to be about. That's exactly what God said he's going to do for Paul. Paul, this is what you're going to do now. I saved you so you can go help save others. I saved you so go help save others. And that is our job as well. Any questions on that? All right, next question on your worksheet. Verse, uh, verse, uh, question seven. Question seven. Why does he say the Jews seized him? Let's look at verse 21. Verse 21, he says, For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. What's the reason? Stated in the previous verse. That's it. That's it. Let's look at verse 20. Verse 20, or verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, throughout all the region of Judea, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do work suitable to repentance. And for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple, tried to kill me. (coughs) In verse 20, if you were a Jew, what's missing? 
If you were a devout Jew who rejected the concept of Christianity, what would be missing in verse 20? Yeah, but if you're a Jew, you don't care if Jesus is the Messiah. That's the message everybody's preaching, but you're not believing. Remember the issues that's been, that's been waging the last several chapters. That he went to the Gentiles, that would be part of the issue. But the message to the Gentiles, that's what I want you to see here. The message to the Gentiles, if you're a devout Jew who does not believe in Jesus, who does not believe in Christianity, but believes in a Messiah, believes in a Messiah's kingdom, you got a couple things missing in the verse. You're going to preach to the Gentiles, they need to be circumcised. There you go. They need to keep the customs of Moses. Folks, that's the primary issue here. It's not just that he went to the Gentiles. It's that when he preached to the Gentiles, he didn't tell them to be circumcised or keep the law of Moses. And remember, that's like 80% of Paul's epistles <laughs> is how the, how the law of Moses relates to the gospel of Christ. I've been getting ready to teach Romans uh, starting in January. That's most of Romans, man. Is that issue? How does the gospel relate to the law? How does the gospel relate to the Jews? Well, this is part of the issue here. Preach to the Gentiles a Messiah, that's fine, that's good, that's great. But you better make sure they're circumcised, you better make sure they keep the law of Moses. When Paul doesn't do that, he is then ostracized as an apostate Jew, he is persecuted greatly, and they want to kill him. That's exactly why he's taken here. Okay? Anybody have any questions on that? Hope I explained that well. All right, next question, question number eight. With what does Paul connect his teachings? Verse 22 and 23. Moses, the prophets, and who? Come on, this is the Bible class answer. Jesus Christ, there you go. Now think about this. Verse 22, he says, I obtained help from God, continuing to this day, witnessing both to the small and the great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. He's saying Old Testament said this would happen. Now here's what he said would happen. Verse 23, that the Christ would suffer... <coughs> that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Man, that's even more direct than the previous couple of verses were. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophets said, of all that Moses said. We need to make sure we recognize that. The Christ would suffer, that he would rise from the dead, that he would proclaim light to the Gentiles and to the Jews. That is what the Messiah would do. Okay? Big, big passage there we need to make sure we see. Now, why does Festus say Paul is out of his mind? Verse 24. Much learning is driving you mad. Think about what he's just said. They didn't think the Gentiles would be part of this community either? Go ahead, Dennis. The Gentiles, you think about two elements here. The biggest issue, concept of the resurrection. Pagans do not believe in a resurrection. Remember that issue in chapter 17 with the Athenians and Mars Hill, uh, the Oropagus. They don't believe in a resurrection. They revile him. The minute he brings up the resurrection, they revile him. That's part of what's going on here. But the idea that not only there's a resurrection, but through that resurrection, all people can be united into one body? Yeah. Come on, Paul. You've went crazy. You have lost your ever-loving mind. That was the Southeast Texas translation. So, he, he, no, you, you're missing it, Paul. You do not have, you do not have your, your wits about you. Ver, uh, question 10. What are the things Paul believes Agrippa knows? Verse 26. Do what? Not exactly. Look at verse 26. For the king, that's a reference to Agrippa, for the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. Part of what he's discussing here is the fulfillment of Christ as the Messiah, uh, Jesus as the Messiah. All of this started, folks, in Judea. That's ground zero. Jerusalem is ground zero for the gospel message. When Jews by the thousands are obeying the gospel in Jerusalem and then spreading out, I'm going to tell you right now, Agrippa, who's considered king of the Jews, he knows some of this. He might not know all the details, 
but he knows some of it. None of this has escaped his sight. That's exactly Paul's point. It wasn't done in the corner somewhere, hidden away from society. He said it was done right under your nose, Agrippa. You know what I'm talking about. Now, Agrippa, probably feeling a little bit warm. A little stuffy in here, Paul. Could we quit talking so much to me? You know, and he's going to get there in just a second. Now, verse 27, Paul says to King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Man, Paul was so talented. I, I, I wish, I wish I could have heard him preach. I imagine, I imagine a, a man kind of like D. Bowman that you just can't help but love and, and was so persuasive in the way he argues, so talented in his ability to communicate those truths. And this is all not even discussing the, the fact that the Spirit is, is behind much of what Paul does. But I'm going to tell you, folks, he looks Agrippa dead in the eyes, and his question is, do you believe the prophets? He's essentially saying, Agrippa, do you believe the Old Testament? Wait, 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 wait. Agrippa, I know you believe the Old Testament. Agrippa knows what he's doing. Oh, Paul. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. He knew what he was doing. Paul is so crafty, so, so able to communicate and argue and convince. He's got Agrippa right there. But I'm going to tell you, though, Agrippa is surrounded by peers and influential high society pagans. He's a little bit of a pagan himself, not quite as much as some of the, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles in that room with him. He's not going to really, he's not really going to change. He doesn't exactly want what Paul is offering. But you can tell, even in the language, and some of the newer translations render this just a little bit better in verse 28. But that phrase, you almost persuade me. The concept is, is you're, you're, you're trying to convince me. In fact, some of them will even say, it basically, but you're, you've almost got me. I mean, he's right there. And just like Felix before, just like Festus before, almost but not quite. And that's where Agrippa, that's where Agrippa ends his, his discussion. We actually do not know, but we should certainly silence our cell phones. We do not know if Agrippa ever obeyed the gospel. It's never stated. We certainly don't see it in the book of Acts. And history would tell us that that, that doesn't happen. There's a couple of elements, though, that I think are worth pointing out. Remember I said this a few weeks ago. We're sitting about 10 to 11 years from the destruction of Jerusalem. We're only about six or so years from the Jewish wars starting in Judea that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. Agrippa, this man, would have been the one who was reigning during that period. There's a whole lot of, of, of moral issues, moral failings that feed into some of this as well. Bernice, Bernice and, and Agrippa... There was actually a lot of rumors that there was an incestuous relationship between the two of them. Bernice was married off really young and then uh, divorced her husband. So there was kind of some unscriptural stuff going on there. And then comes back and lives with her brother, who's only a year younger than she is. Or excuse me, she's a year younger than he is. And so they lived together most of their lives. She was a constant companion of his. So yeah, rumors kind of started. They were incestuous. She ends up being the mistress of Vespasian a little later in Rome. And when he becomes emperor, she's kind of discarded, moves back in with brother in Judea. It's kind of a sad little statement of history. Here they are, presented with the gospel, opportunity to obey it, opportunity to change their life. They don't want it. Now, Agrippa ends up siding with Rome when they destroy Jerusalem, and then he ends up getting a pretty cush life in, Jeru or in, a, in Rome after that. But here's the sad event, Paul preaching the gospel to him, and he will not accept it. <coughs> Verse, question 11. Question 11. What is Paul's deepest wish? Verse 29, Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. What's his, or what's his deepest wish here? That they would convert, that they'd obey the gospel. It's kind of a little bit poetic. You know, a Christian, a Christian is enslaved to Christ. 
We are bondservants of Christ. We relinquish our rights. We relinquish our individual autonomy. We relinquish, relinquish all authority vested in ourselves. And we submit to King Jesus. Romans 6 talks about that. I'm going to allude to Romans 6 in my lesson this morning for that, that, that same concept. We, we surrender to God and through Christ his Son. So Paul is essentially saying, I wish you'd be a prisoner like me, but not the same kind of prisoner. And when he says these chains, in verse 29, except for these chains, the idea is he's holding up the chains that are binding him. He said, I wish you'd be like me. I wish you would convert. I wish you would obey the gospel. I wish you would give your life over to King Jesus and be everything I am except for these chains. And that's exactly the life Jesus calls for us today. Imprisoned for him and imprisoned to him. The final question, question number 12. What's the conclusion? Verses 31 and 32. That he's asked to go to Caesar and he cannot go free at this point. Now, I want you to notice in verse 31, verse 31, after the governor, Bernice, and King Agrippa all stand up, those who sat with them stand up. Seems to be they leave the chamber. Agrippa says, verse 31, or excuse me, they, talking among themselves, say in verse 31, this man is doing nothing worthy of death or chains. It's the second statement of Paul's innocence in the passage. Okay, make sure you see that. It's a subtle thing, but remember, as Theophilus reads through this, what, is, what he is reminded of over and over and over again, Paul has not done anything wrong. He's innocent. Even Roman officials recognize his innocence. It's the Jews and the animosity between the Jews and Christianity that's created some of this hardship. But Paul's innocent. He would have gone free, verse 32, had he not appealed to Caesar. Uh, I made the observation, historically, that's probably... That's probably the, the case. Once you appealed to Caesar, there wasn't really anything there that, that the Roman official could do. There is some discussion, some debate about whether or not a Roman official had the ability to free you once you appealed to Caesar. If he determined you were free and innocent, he could let you go. But even that's kind of up for discussion. That's up for debate. By all accounts, historically, it seems, once you appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you went. Nothing changed that. And so that's, well, that's how this story ends here. We'll jump into chapter 27 in class on Wednesday. Appreciate your attention.